Okay. So <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about today is exoseismology and how that applies uh, to galactic archaeology, in particular for K2 and very soon TESS. So first some motivation, uh, why, why does this really matter? Uh, it's because we know from previous missions like Kepler and K2, sorry, Kepler and Koro, that we can use astroseismology of red giant stars to probe very far into the galaxy. Now, we have done that, and just before I show you some results, I just wanted to make sure everyone is on the same page here. Uh, what I mean when I talk about astroseismology of red giants, I'm talking about the sort of oscillations that happens in the sun because it's the same in giants. So surface convection excites standing sound waves, and they make the star ring in lots of different modes of oscillation. And we can see that as a, a variation in, in the brightness. And here I'm actually showing the sun's variation in brightness as a function of time. And so the way we analyze the data is we take the Fourier transform, which is shown at the last uh, panel. And so that shows essentially the, the content of, of sinusoids in that signal. And you can see every peak is the oscillation frequency and height of it is the amplitude of that oscillation frequency happening. And that is the data we are looking at. So um, to do real seismology, we would kind of look at individual frequencies, but we are not doing that here. But for galactic archaeology, we need thousands of stars. So we're doing ensemble astroseismology, or as I like to call it, the IKEA version, um, which is kind of uh, wholesale. Um, so what we do is we compress this signal into two data points per star. One of them is new max. And so that is the frequency where most of the acoustic power comes out. Uh, and so if you kind of squint at the, at the top, you can see there's, there's a maximum of where all the power is, that's new max. Um, and then we have delta nu, which is the other measurement. And that is the frequency separation that kind of uh, tells you how, uh, how much you have to shift the spectrum before it repeats itself. Uh, you can see this repeated pattern going on. And those two parameters, they depend on um, measurements uh, of fundamental measurements uh, we can make on the star, like mass, radius, and temperature. And we can therefore combine those two relations uh, to get mass uh, and radius just from those two. Obviously, you need a temperature input as well. Um, and you can get for free, therefore, luminosity uh, and a distance. And because we are talking about giants, um, when we also have a metallicity, we can get a pretty good handle on the age, which was also mentioned yesterday. And this is the kind of uncertainties we can get by doing this sort of IKEA version of seismology uh, on, on the fundamental parameters of stars. Um, so that is quite powerful when you have lots of them uh, because you can start to look for trends. Um, now, we, we did that very early on, but um, those previous missions like Kepler weren't designed for that. And so we found some discrepancies between our simulation in red and the data in black, in particular for mass. But we weren't quite sure why we saw that difference. And that was because we weren't quite sure what the selection function of the data was. And so we couldn't say whether it was a, a problem with the data or a problem with the model. Um, and so luckily, along came K2, which was uh, the failed K, uh, Kepler mission um, that became this new mission that looked along the ecliptic. And it gave us an, a beautiful opportunity to select stars with a very well-defined selection function that we could reproduce later on. Not only that, it enabled us to look at very different regions of the galaxy. So we could see whether the discrepancy we saw in the Kepler field would be the same or maybe even different in different directions of the galaxy to see whether it was actually the model that had some issues and how that would uh, turn into different parts of, of the Milky Way. And so <clears throat> the results I'm showing you here are just for four campaigns of K2, uh, known as the uh, Galactic Archaeology Program, and it was followed up by what is known as K2 Hermes, which is Gala on the K2 fields. Uh, and so the results are based on these four campaigns, uh, which was the data release two of, of the K2 gap. So the two blue ones are the high latitude ones, the two red ones are the low latitude ones, and I've basically repeated the analysis we did for Kepler, now for K2, where again, I've ordered the high latitude at the top and the low latitude at the bottom. And we can see that the Galaxia model has the same problem in the K2 fields as we saw in Kepler, which is shown at the bottom for reference. Now, 
what we can see immediately is that the discrepancy is largest for the high latitude fields. And so kind of the ring is, is, is uh, the bell is ringing in your head. It might be something to do with uh, a population that we typically look at when we look at high latitude fields. Um, and so we, with this K2 Hermes data, where we now have middle vistices for all the stars, we could also look at middle vistices. And indeed, we see the same problem. We see there is a middle vistices discrepancy, and it is mostly for the high latitude. Um, and obviously, we think, OK, it must be a middle vistices problem of something that is high up, which is something like a thick disk. And so what Sanjeev did, who uh, has made the Galaxia model, he looked at data from Gala and Apogee, which is in blue, so the solid and dotted lines, in, uh, in different uh, how the middle east depend on galactocentric radius, and then in different slices of where you are relative to the disk. So close in disk is to the left, and far away from the disk uh, uh, is to the right, up to a three kiloparsecs. And you can see that the data uh, from Apogee and Gala they agree nicely with each other for all the heights above and below the plane. Uh, however, uh, we can see the old galaxy model, which is the one we couldn't match with the K2 data, uh, does very poorly when we go high up uh, towards the thick disk in the model. And so what Sanji did was just to dial a single knob, which was the middle C of the thick disk, to make it match with the data, which is what we call the new uh, galaxy model in green, as you can see, matching the data. And so we went back and went, OK, how does that do for the K2 fields? It indeed did quite well, particularly for the high latitude fields. And we would see how well was this uh, correction actually going to influence our mass discrepancies. Um, and I should say this, what I call mass is called kappa m. It's just a seismic part of the mass. So we have taken temperature out. But you can, for this talk, just regard it as mass in solar units. Um, and what we see is with the new Galaxy model that just has to change the middle of the thickness, it indeed corrects mostly uh, the discrepancy we see, and in its particular, uh, doing well in the, in the high latitude fields. So that has now been done for all the campaigns because we are done with the K2 gap uh, and the results of this and all the details about the selection function for K2 gap will be coming in this paper uh, later this year. So if you are into doing population synthesis using the K2 data, uh, you should check out that paper. Now, another thing I will talk about at the end of my talk is um, some work that we have been doing here at UNSW in particular, um, and that is to cope with this large number of data we are getting. And we started to see that already with K2, because with Kepler, we got just more data of the same stars all the time with K2, we started to get new stars every three months. Two minutes. Uh, thank you. And so we had to deal with that. And in the future, tests will be uh, even um, worse in quotation um, because there will be a lot more data. So uh, just to give you an idea uh, of what I'm going to show here, I'm showing you the same measurement for mass now on the y-axis, so the, the kappa m. Um, and then on the x-axis, we have new max. And you can think of that as a luminosity. So what you see in blue is the, the red giant branch stars evolving up the red giant branch, so to the left, and then igniting helium uh, at the tip. And then they whoosh back towards the red part, which is the helium core burning phase, which is this upside down Nike symbol. And so this is what this diagram looks like when you have essentially no errors. It's like perfect four years of Kepler data. So it is just to give your own uh, neural network an image of what, what the the good world looks like when you don't have any problems. And this is a single uh, analysis pipeline that have given those results, but they have been eyeballed. So an expert have looked at every damn uh, power spectrum to make sure that the results are correct. Just like a spectroscopist would do to be absolutely sure the fit to the spectrum is correct, okay? So that's why we know this is the truth. Now, if you ask automated pipelines to do the best they can do and give us results of delta nu and nu max for K2, this is what you get. And so typically what we have been doing is we are combining data from different pipelines to get a consensus value because we don't have time to go through it by eye. Um, but what we have been working on, and this is basically spearheaded by um, Claudia who's sitting in the room here. So if you have any questions, you can ask her to make an I, an I AI method that does the same job as the expert, looking at the raw data, 
doesn't look at this, this, this diagram at all. It just looks at the raw data and says, is the result from this pipeline uh, in agreement with what the data shows? And this is what you get after you vet the results using that AI method. And it looks, as the Prime Minister said, couldn't be better. Or how good is that? Um, and so you can really start to see the features like we see in Kepler. Obviously, the uncertainties are larger because there's only three months of data per K2 star. But it's very good. Um, quite encouraging. And for tests, we need more of that. But we also need detections. And so to all, in order to sift through the haystack of millions of light curves in tests, uh, we have to detect um, you know, which of them show oscillations. And we are getting full sky coverage. So there are really millions and millions of light curves to, to sift through. And so this was some work done by uh, my now previous PhD student, uh, Mark Hunt, who is now a, a fellow in the US. So he, he looked at an, an eye method to detect where, the, where there is oscillations in the power spectrum. And what he basically has done is combine that with Gaia and now got the first full sky image of what the seismic mass, or if you like, age looks like across the sky. And with this beautiful image, I will just stop and say thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Dennis. We have time for two questions. One is in the chat, so I'm just going to read it out. Now that from Jake Clark, now that TESS is going back to the K2 fields in the next few months, how will that data improve the science you were able to obtain with K2 Hermes? So I guess the question is, um, how, how much will the seismology improve for the K2 stars uh, when we get more data? Um, I mean, I'm, I haven't done any simulation of that, but clearly we will get the more coverage uh, of the stars, but I haven't done a particular simulation to say how, how much better. Obviously people will do it um, and start to combine uh, the data from TESS and, and K2, but there will be an improvement. Um, we will get about um, a month extra of data. So there will be some improvement. It, it won't be a huge improvement, but there will be some improvement. Any other questions? I'm going to use chair privilege and just ask mine. This is an incredible seismic test detection map of the, the galaxy you've left us with. Um, is I, I keep hearing that there's systematics in tests and so on and so forth. What you Have these not affected you in generating this? Um, what, what sort of systematics are you thinking about in particular? Oh, I... To be honest, I just this is just from I don't ha have any backing up in saying that I just have heard people say, oh, it's hard to do things with it, but that you have a whole beautiful age map of the galaxy. Yeah, so I mean, clearly they are systematic. So this this data here is, is based on the MIT's quick look uh, pipeline data. And so this is just the minimum what we can do by basically a quick look of the seismology. Uh, we are still uh, waiting for the complete set of full sky data that is made specifically for astro seismology, uh, which is coming um, from the from the TESOC database. And they have already started uh, putting out the first few sectors, but we we are still needing to look into that. And and we are hoping that obviously that data will do better than the quick look. Um, so that that would just mean a higher yield essentially. Uh, but as such, there's not. Um, in the way that the data have been analyzed here, there has, there's no particular biases other than you have to cut away the most luminous and the least luminous stars, basically. Uh, so it's not, yeah. Yeah, thank you. thank you. That was a better framing of my question, the biases. And there's one more question we have time for, which is from Simon Campbell. Do you use kappa mass to avoid noise from effective temperature or another reason? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's basically to test the seismology uh, purely. Um, and so as, as indicated by the question, you, you, don't, you don't try to look into too many problems at the same time. You just want to look at the seismology part before you start to throw in your temperature. 